I would like to start my uh, discussion and my remarks with sharing with you first a short story. This is the story of a company who is probably one of the most innovative companies in the world. And it's a company who actually created an industry which has changed our life and our culture uh, forever. This is also the story of a company who, being a dominant force in its market and its industry once, is now at the brink of its uh, death and uh, is struggling to survive. This is the story of Motorola, which in 1983 created the first portable handset in the world, um, for a cellular handset. And it was called Dynatech. It was large, it was big and bulky. I call it luggable. And it was, uh, had limited functionality. It had, uh, and it was expensive actually. It's $3,500 a pop. Only early adopters and innovators were able to buy it if they could afford it. But Motorola didn't stop there. They kept innovating, and through their technical innovation and engineering know-how, they introduced many great products into the market, and many firsts. For example, in 1990s, some of you now remember these, uh, MicroTAC, which was the first foldable tele uh, handset in the market, and eventually the uh, StarTAC, which was even smaller, and you could put it in your shirt pocket now. And these were greatly engineered, innovative products that uh, had lots of functionality and features, and they really cemented and reinforced Motorola's mar uh, in dominance in the market. And again, in 2004, they introduced another first, uh, the thinnest phone in the market, uh, handset in the market, which was all enclosed in metal, and it was an engineering and uh, technolog technological marvel for those days. And actually, they sold 130 million of them the next three years after the introduction, which, is, which are really large number, even large numbers for even these today's standards. And then after that, there was nothing. They, they, they still kept innovating. They still created great engineered products, but there was nothing. And then as all of us know, they uh, became a shadow of themselves, of old self, and they started struggling, and they spun off that division, which eventually was bought by Google for their intellectual property, uh, the technological know-how, and engineering know-how. And we'll see what happens to that company, but nothing happened. But the interesting thing is that this is not uh, uncommon these days. A lot of our innovative leaders are becoming commodity losers. You can, and it's not just in the technology world or uh, consumer electronic world. It is in other areas, uh, other sectors as well. And all of these guys are still innovative and they are still tr creating well-engineered products into the market. So what is happening? And that's something that over 30 years being in the business of design and innovation, we have seen a pattern uh, uh, emerging. And that pattern is that when these companies, which is a, very, a major factor that actually they don't realize it themselves, because when I talk to them, they, they don't get it. I'm sorry, but they don't realize it. But it is when they're moving from one innovation domain or space into another innovation space, which is they're not used to, or they don't have the mindset, or they don't, you know, they know about it maybe, but they don't know how to do it. And that's where the fundamental issue exists. And so what are these innovation spaces? Let me talk to you about that. Well, we have defined three distinct innovation spaces out there that companies are engaged in these days. One is called technology innovation, one we call product innovation, and the other one is experience innovation. And they all have distinct characteristics. Let me, again, talk to you briefly about the, their characteristics. For the technology innovator, the focus of the, uh, this uh, type of work is all about science. That's what they are about. And their core competency is all about research and development, and they live for discovery. That's what they're all about. They're looking for the new things, new capabilities, new uh, you know, methods, and uh, that's just that's their, their world. And they can measure it very easily by looking at how many patents, and if it's patentable or not, and things like that. So it's very much focused around science and R&D. Now, the, and we have companies that actually are very good at 
uh, in that sector, and these are good examples. Intel, Google, I call them technology company, and Tech TI is the same. The next one is product innovators. The, a product innovator focuses on function. It's all about how it works. What does it do? How many features it has? It's all, then their core competency is all about engineering, manufacturing, uh, supply chain management, processes, and it's all that stuff. And it, they're very measurable too. And they measure, as I said, they measure their stuff uh, by sales numbers, you know, how many SKUs, what, what feature sets they have, and these are all very black and white, and you can put numbers in the front of them. The third type of innovation, which is, uh, by the way, these are some of the uh, examples of technology innovators, Lenovo, Dyson, Nokia, uh, no, I mean, uh, product innovators. The third one, which is this experience innovation, is the focus is on emotions. That's what they're about. That's all, it's all about how does the consumer feel, their co uh, the core consumer feels, and how do they connect to their hearts and minds, and it's all about integration. They usually don't invent anything. They bring a lot of ideas, a lot of products out there together. They integrate, they integrate in internally, work you know, the different divisions and different groups work together, and they tell a great story. They don't talk about features. They talk about the essence of the, what the product is. They tell a story, and they have ultimate empathy to the end, that end consumer. And they measure their success with lo uh, based on love and loyalty that they create, which is very hard to put numbers in the front of. And again, uh, the examples are very well known to all of you, and they're in different sectors as well. So, why this experience innovation is uh, people? Because you know, the last few years, actually the last 10 years, we have seen a lot of companies trying to get into that space. And the last five years, at least six to 10 companies have come to us and asked us, help us to get into the experience innovation uh, domain or teach us how it works because they know about it, but they don't know how to do it. And of course, the question is that why uh, the this is the, uh, why they want to get in there. Well, one is that it's a new space. Uh, it, since we have moved from industrial economy to experience economy for, for the last few years, it, this has become a very new space for them to, uh, act, you know, to get engaged. And it's all about meaning because the, the, the consumer of, of an experience is searching for meaning. So things have changed, and it's a very new territory, and it's, uh, uh, they see it as being very profitable. The next one is that it's a, uh, it's a very successful area. Because right now, if you look at the most visibly valuable companies on Earth are, techno are experience innovators. So it's a very successful, they, they see a lot of successful companies companies activating in that area, and, uh, and they're all highly valued. The other one is that it's highly desired. If you have a choice between great experience and cutting-edge technology, well, most of us, including myself, who's a laggard, there we all want to go, we buy experience, great experience is what we go for. So that's uh, it's the mass market desire is about meaning and it's about experience. It's an open market. It's huge and there's no one way to do experience innovation. And many industries, many sectors can do that. So it's a huge, huge market. It is the mass market. But there is one caveat, one fundamental requirement to be an experienced innovator. And that is that companies have to be built from ground up around the consumer. That's really, really important. You know, so you got to really, for the, uh, you know, think your way of thinking and you know, build the company or move the company around the consumer. And again, we are seeing more and more companies trying to move from one innovation space to another one, especially from technology to experience, and it is expensive and time consuming. Uh, now, it is easier to go from technology to product innovation because there's a lot of similarities, measurement systems are very black and white. But when you're moving from a technology into an experience innovation area, it's almost impossible because there's 
totally opposed mindset. The technology innovator is just looking at what's new, and they don't care what the experience is, it's that discovery thing, and the experience innovator looks at, I don't care if it's new or not, what type of experience does it create for my customer? And actually, we have seen that over the last 15, 20 years, working with Intel, trying to innovate through the customer experience, and it's been very difficult and very time-consuming, expensive, and uh, they're still not there. So we see that struggle. And, but the thing is that we need all three spaces. It's not that one is better than the other one. Uh, no, we don't uh, have to all become an experience innovators. We need, uh, Apple needed all three types of experience inno uh, inno innovation in order to do what they're doing. And Intel is still a very profitable company, being an experience a technology innovator. And IBM, which years ago, everybody wrote them off, they actually let go of their end consumer kind of field that they were in and then focused back in uh, doing uh, what they used to do really good at, uh, that is services and B2B and technology. So we need all three of them. But uh, the question now we have to ask, what should Motorola have done based on what I just talked about? Well, they could have stayed focused on early adopters, just make stuff for high, you know, cutting edge stuff, really well engineered stuff, and talk about feature sets and everything else, and sell it to early adopters and innovators. Or they could have spun off a new company with uh, experience innovation mindset, not what they did because they took the same type of people and put them in a different company. That, they, they, that mindset moved. No, they, you have to you know, spin off the company with a different mindset. That, the other thing they could have done is that they could have partnered with a company who actually has that type of a mindset uh, and work together and they would uh, uh, create the delivery the, no, uh, of the experience for that company. So the, la the thing that we need to talk about now, just to wrap up, is that what should we do as people who are starting new companies, start or running, a new com uh, running companies, small or large, what is it that we should be doing? Well, one of the things that uh, I, we, should, we should do is that we should celebrate all the three of, uh, peop you know, types of people and technologists. Uh, you know, engineers and designers all are equal. There is no difference. We need them all. The other thing we should be doing is to acknowledge that culture shift is really, really hard. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's, a lot of times it doesn't happen. There are times that happens, but it takes a lot of time and effort. But we, can, we should not ask. We cannot, you know, again, we, we, everybody comes to Ziba and talks about how can we be more like Apple. That's not the question you should be asking. You should really get to understand who you are, what are you wired for, what is your personality, what is your uh, mindset, and really ask, the first thing you want to ask is, what is my innovation space before you embark on a transition or change? Thank you very much.